from North Beach Podcasts in partnership with TSN Seasons. Greetings and welcome to episode two of season two of the Ray and Greg's Hockey Podcast. For those who are joining us via YouTube, um, I can see Ray, you can see Ray, and we can see that he's not normally in the comfy confines of his home uh, in British Columbia, but you do look pretty comfortable there in that lovely hotel room in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, where Ray... You've just started, what is it, four or five days now of of quarantine? Uh, Four days, but I got here last night. Um, So it's kind of like a little over four days. Um, And uh, yeah, I, I, look, I got a, I got a large sort of like a little sweet thing going here. And so I got plenty of room. Yes. uh, Well, as it should be, I should say. Um, But uh, anyway, but wherever you are, I can't leave. Like I can't, I can open the door for the guy to administer the COVID test. And then I got to close the door. Yeah. So we had a zoom call last night with, uh, you know, a couple of like with the producer and the director and a couple other nitwits on our crew. And, uh, so now we've got a bunch of prop bets for the Thursday night football game with the Raiders. (laughs) And so uh, we're, we're trying to stay busy drinks. Now, could you do this? Because again, very strict restrictions um, in Edmonton for the World Junior Championship. Um, can you stand on your threshold with a putter in your hand, ball on the carpet or on the floor, and you putt it down the hallway, and then somebody puts it back, and you just continue to do that back and forth? Well, would re- would have required a little more planning. Uh, I You can step out of your room because most guys are getting food delivered. Um, through the hotel. Yeah. So you're allowed to open the door to pick up the tray to bring it in. Okay. So I think you could stand out there. Um, but I don't have a golf ball or my putter, which was actually really shitty planning by my, by my, by the way, I got here yesterday, got into the room, unpacked about six 30 by seven o'clock. I was on the phone to Cammy. Hey, I forgot this. I forgot that. (laughs) I forget. So she's sending a package today. I'm what an idiot I am. (laughs) Okay, by the way, so we're recording this podcast, episode two of season two, on uh, Thursday. I don't even know what the date is. I, like, I, It's like Groundhog Day for me. So what is it? December 17th, 17th? right? 17th, there we 17th. go. 17th. Uh, so I'm going to guess that flying in from Vancouver on Wednesday, the 16th, was your first time using air travel since March. Is that correct? Yeah, March 13th was yeah. uh, when the season got shut down. I flew home on the Friday. Mm-hmm. which was March 13th. And, uh, and I have not basically, I've been to maybe like three or four places. We yeah. went camping in the summer, but we drove and went camping. Um, I've been to the golf course, the soccer field, the grocery store. And I really can't think of too many more outings that I've had. Yeah. Um, so getting into the airport, was weird drags like first of all there's nobody there like i don't know how many people are flying but at this time of year right it's usually just packed in the vancouver airport and there's you know relatively nobody there nobody in security um you know like at the desk it was easy to check in and throw my bags there and um but it's weird like you know you walk in you got your mask on of course and nobody's really looks at each other and yeah kind of strange so so look not an endorsement for air canada um but i'm looking forward to flying again because it it, yeah. it gives you that that sense of freedom that we've taken for granted forever right and and you can fly now you can travel uh, but there is a stigma that's attached to it so walk us through i mean you just described walking into the airport um it's basically vacant you've got a mask on i i are you wearing gloves like what what is that environment like before, you know, when you check in to when you're sitting in your comfortable seat on whatever flight it was en route to Edmonton? Yeah, I, I didn't wear gloves. Um, I got my sanitizer in my pocket. Yeah. Um, get up to security. You know, everything's the same. You go through security. You're, you know, nobody's really in line as close as they normally would be, right? Everybody's spread out. Yeah. Um, so I get my stuff, ticket, get scanned go through the, you know, the, whatever the metal detector and the thing goes off and I'm like, (laughs) I'm wearing jeans. I got no belt on because that's already in the bucket. 
um, I got a, you know, a sweater. That's it. My socks. And, uh, so the guy starts to step over here. He's wanding me as he get. he goes, uh, lift up your shirts, you know, cause I want to do my belt area. And as he good, does that, I'm like, Oh, my knee. You and he's like, if you got a, he goes, if you got an artificial knee, I said, yeah, he goes, Oh, that'll go off every time. He goes, Hey, you're walking good though. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh, thanks. And so we got into a discussion. So he we went over the, my knee and it's like, beep, 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 beep. And so I went, went, you know, collected everything. Everything's the same, Drake. There's just less people. And then when you get to the gate area, you know, people are spaced out unless they're sitting with their families. You There's a protocol to get on the plane. You got to lower your mask below your chin so they can, you know, see your ID. Get onto the plane and, man, nobody moved. <laughs> it was weird. Nobody went to the bathroom. Nobody moved. Everybody sat down. I was um, in my seat, the fellow beside me, right? He was over there. Like he didn't reach across me or I didn't reach, you know, like there was, everybody was in their space and I felt totally fine flying there. It, I don't know why though, it felt like a pain in the ass to have my mask on. Right. You know, because I had it on from the second I walked in the airport until I got in my room, which would have been, let's see, 11 uh, seven hours. Yeah. You know, and, and I know the healthcare professionals do this all the time and, you know, and, but you know, I just lowered it down a couple of times to, you know, to take a drink and, but it was weird. It, yeah. it, that was weird. Then you get to the airport, there's a dedicated car that picks us up because we're in, we're literally in quarantine from the second we hit the ground, we get our bags, put them in the truck, and then we're in quarantine. Mm -hmm. So get to the air or got to the hotel, check in, get my bracelet that if, if I leave the room, yeah, Alberta health gets a notice and I'm out. So the Swedish manager, I don't know what the hell this guy's thinking. They've already lost four players. They've lost their coaching staff. This knucklehead goes back gets into the hotel, goes back to the airport to get some forgotten luggage. Oh. Well, he broke quarantine. He's gone. They're sending, he's got to go home. And I know he's just trying to help. And I'm like, but I, there is no way you can't realize you're in quarantine. Mm -hmm. There's a fence around the hotel, like pretty hard not to notice that. Yeah. So I'm intrigued by this for a lot of reasons because it's your experience. Um, but the National Hockey League has sent out what they describe as a um, mock draft of travel protocol. You know, again, assuming that the oh, National yeah, Hockey yeah. League gets going in mid-January, and I, I feel like it's a safe assumption. And we'll talk about some of that coming up in headlines. But I'm going through this, you know, this this document, and you know, something as as simplistic as okay, once you get on the airplane, you have an assigned seat for the duration of the season. That's your seat. You better like it because that's your seat. You have to stay in that seat. You cannot move from that seat unless you have to use the washroom. That's it. So imagine yourself here as a player who flew countless times back in the day, yeah. right? Wasn't that – yeah, look, I, I, I didn't expect, given that we're still in the midst of the second wave of the pandemic, the guys are going to do or be able to do what they used to do, get back to the plane, you know, get the cards out and start playing poker and, and all of that nonsense. Um, but you know, from, from how restrictive it needs to be on the airplane to getting into the hotel and, you know, them outlining that, look, we know that you're going to have to take an elevator at some point, but there's going to be squares on the floor of the elevator and, and an occupancy concern, right? Only two, three, <laughs> four, yep. I, whatever the size of the elevator is, I get it. But then they go, okay, well, Anytime you can take the stairs and avoid the elevator. So it has everything to do with staying away from everybody else. And there's a provision in here. And again, this is just the mock draft, right? There's a provision um, that says if you're going into uh, a higher COVID rate city or the numbers are on the rise in that city, then we have the jurisdiction to lock things right down. So even though we don't want you to go to restaurants, you can't go to restaurants no matter where you are, 
even to go for a simple walk, we have the authority to shut that down. If okay, you know, a couple things that jump right out at <laughs> first off. So you're sitting on the plane. At least the guys now they got their gimmicks, right? They can yeah, yeah. They can play uh video games. You don't have to be in the same seat or near each other. They can play they a lot of them play golf <laughs> tournaments and uh Call of Duty and stuff. So they yeah. can they can play that. Yeah. Um the card game, they're gonna have to get creative. So what you're gonna have to hope is when you're putting in the seats that yeah. you can get the card guys in the same section so they can lay the cards down on the floor as the table <laughs> and like that's going to be you know so if you picture you have four guys sitting on the aisle and everybody is throwing their cards down on the floor and whatever they might be betting on the yeah. floor that's the only way you can play cards <laughs> um i man i used to love walking around the plane there's you're on a four hour flight you walk around have a conversation oh. here and there well Clearly, that's not going to happen, right? Doesn't sound this like might it. force this might force some guys to actually read a book yeah. or something. And the God second forbid. thing was the stairs. Can you imagine a lot of the coaches having to go up and down the stairs? I think this is great for their cardiovascular. <laughs> ah, there are certain some of them are in pretty good shape. Who's I would say the majority yeah. of them wouldn't be too disturbed. by Oh, I think they, I think anyone that had to use the stairs would be pissed off. That's what I think. <laughs> if you got out there and the elevator opened up and there's four guys in there and you're like, I got to go down the stairs. Yeah. I mean, we'll all get through it, but down the stairs you go. <laughs> all right. Uh, I don't, you can see it. And, and it, again, anyone checking in on, on YouTube can see it. I'm moving back and forth in my chair for those who can't see it and they're listening because We've got new blinds here in my fancy new office. Well, apparently they don't work. Well, they're closed, but you can see the sun is is bleeding through. Well, what kind of and blinds that, are they? They're the the, the heavy duty wooden ones. You know, well, shutters, clearly, not blinds. Yeah, yeah. Clearly, the they don't work. Ah, it's ridiculous. Anyway, I can't believe you bought this new house, and you've got newspapers taped over the window, <laughs> and and the lights coming in. My neighbor has like tin foil. On his no, window. he doesn't. I, 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 yes, he does, and I I won't take a picture because I don't I don't understand it. Automatically, when I look at it, bad things come to mind. Like when you have to put aluminum foil over your windows, what the hell is going on inside those rooms that you have to block out all the sun and make sure that nobody can see inside? I don't know. It's now, like I, a, had, I had I had a sort of Dexter. Yeah, there is some shady stuff potentially <laughs> there. I roomed with Paul McDermott in Hartford. He used yeah. to take a roll of hockey tape okay. from at the morning skate, bring it back. By the time he was finished taping the curtains to the wall, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. <laughs> he needed it to be a cave wow. in there. And so he'd go, time to cave it up. And man, oh, you'd hear it. Whoosh, 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 taping <laughs> everything to the wall so we, wow. we couldn't get any light in it. He couldn't sleep in your office. No. Well, and speaking of windows, uh, Holly Dreger and I are having a bit of a disagreement. It's a little tense around the house. Um, who's, I don't know uh, what, whose issue? Whose issue do you think it is? Before you tell us the issue, whose issue is it? Hers. Well, Ooh. it's it's an issue she's dealing with. I don't know. I mean, she's fifty. I, I, all I know is it's it's like minus eight degrees Celsius, right. and I've got windows open all the way through my house. And, and if I didn't have a better candidate for the throat punch, which we're, we're going to get to later in the podcast, I love her dearly. I mean, I, I wouldn't be sitting here chatting with you without the support of Holly Dreger, but it's minus eight and, and the windows upstairs in our bedroom are open, <laughs> open around the house. I'm like, what are we doing here? Okay. So the windows are open. And then, so are you turning the heat up? Well, that's another issue because I had this fancy, I'm sure you guys have this because you've got you know, the most tech-friendly smart home in Canada. Um, I think it's Which called, I'm an idiot and can't touch anything, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I'm right there with you. But I, I think it's called the Nest Yeah, we got one of those. Yeah. Don't know how to use it. Well, I thought I did. Evidently, I don't. Um, but the screen goes haywire on it earlier this week. And, I mean, clearly the screen is is mucked up. I don't, I don't know what happened to it. So There's I a prairie word, by the way. <laughs> mucked up? mucked up 
Yeah. By the way, back up. I can't can't stop staring at that light going across. Your I don't know what I'm going to do. Perfect. With it. Have to pop. Right there. No, no. Over to your left. To your left. Oh, no. Which there. left? Perfect. That left. Your left. On your left right. hand. Now it's That's in my. Your, now it's like you know what's going to happen. It's it's literally going to climb up until it's it's. You know headway. the sun moves, right? Yeah. Well, we're going to have to pause here momentarily, and I'm going to have to fix it. Should we pause? Oh, we're quickly? not pausing. No, you're fixing it. <laughs> Move to the left. Your left hand. That's your right hand. I know, but if I go left, it's going to be worse. Did no, you want keep going left. I'm, wa I'm watching it. There. Yeah. Perfect. That better? Okay, Much no. better. Oh, okay. for the love of God. Okay. Continue but, with your story why you can't fix the nest. I can't. But we're, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Anyway. It, I mean, I love the technology of it because it shows you exactly, exactly. If it's 21.4 degrees Celsius in your house, you know that. And you can set it by the minute if you choose, right? Uh, so I, I do appreciate that. Um, so it breaks down. Uh, furnace guy comes over, Steve, and he goes, yeah, sorry, I, I'm going to have to get a replacement. I don't have one, but I've got an old one in my truck. So it's the old one where you just move the the... Yeah. the the stick on top of the thermostat. So I, it's somewhere between 20 and 25 degrees in this house right now. Okay, so two things. One, my dad must have had a thermostat attached to his veins. Okay. Because if anyone moved the thermostat, he'd go, hey, who touched the thermostat? Ooh, yeah. had to be 68 degrees. Yeah. He'd say, put on a sweater. So my mom would be like, Ed, it's cold in here. Put on a sweater. Man, he had that thing. He had it locked down. So here's all. I bet you, Cammy. So you can you can you can attach. There's an app from. Oh, the she's got it. There, guaranteed, got it. she has it, and you don't, right? Well, not only do I not have it, I don't know how to use it. Even she wanted to install it. I'm like, I don't even want to know because I can't figure it out. But here's the thing. So we've got these things in our house, right? You oh, you can change the volume on the TV here because it all connects over here. I must say once a month, I'm not even kidding. I just want a normal freaking TV. I want to turn it off and turn it on, turn it on and off. That's it. <laughs> I want the volume to go up and down. I don't want zones and all this stuff. I can't figure it out, Drakes. I can't figure it out. So the technology that you're going through, you're going to lose this. The windows are going to stay open. Put on a sweater. Yeah, I'm going to have to. Headlines brought to you by our friends at Legaro Jewelers. This holiday season, Rain Dregs fans get to shop with a hefty discount of 10% off all regularly priced items site-wide at Legaro.com by using the code RAY10. So thank you to Legaro Jewelers, big supporter of the Rain Dregs Hockey yep. Podcast. Um, Ray, we, don't, we haven't talked a lot about the inner workings and the logistics and the negotiations with the National Hockey League, the PA, um, but I do feel like that, that we got to apply a little bit of hockey know-how and relevance uh, to what we can expect. So we're expecting that mid-January start. Uh, we're expecting a 56-game NHL regular season schedule. From right. a player's standpoint, I mean, take me back. I guess it, it was 1995, right? You played and they had the 14th right. yep. season because of the, the work stoppage. Um, how big of a deal, if at all, is it going to be for the players to adjust from 82 games down to 56 or back when you played down to 48? Um, I, it'll be a topic of almost daily conversation when the guys first get together. Mm -hmm. um, and then it just becomes your season. You know, you know, like nobody in game 11 is going, wow, well, you are if you keep losing, but you're like, wow, I got 71 more games to go. Like you're just yeah. playing the next game. You know you know, your immediate schedule and you don't really think about the 82 games. What will happen to the guys, I, I can almost guarantee this, is about 20 games in, they'll realize, not that they don't know, but they'll realize, man, we only got 36 games left. Right. Like, there's not much time here. We're already, like, into a bit of a playoff race or into, if you're five or seven points behind, you realize, man, we only got 36 games. There's or 30 games or it happens fast because don't forget, it's not just the number of games. It's the days that those games are compacted right. into. And so you have two bad weeks. 
that could be seven games, eight games. And say you go one and seven, how are you going to make that back up? Like it, it, everything becomes more urgent, more critical. And there's a point where the guys will realize it. But at the start, after they talk about it, they're just playing their season. Right. So also take me back to maybe the last five years of your playing career. You know, and, you know, you made okay money. I, I mean, you were sure. at a time when towards the end of your career, players were starting to get, uh, get paid. Uh, so wisely, the NHL, the Players Association, decided to, to shelve the, the financial issues that they have with one another. Mm-hmm. Um, now you're prolonging the inevitable, right? Like at some yeah. point, they're, they're going to have to deal with this. And uh, on the short term, what it means is we're likely going to see that flat cap of 81.5, 81, 81 million. Uh, 500,000 for uh, probably the next four years, right? Right. You know, probably the next four years. So from an older player perspective, is that all you're worried about? You're just worried about, look, I don't want to pay more escrow. I don't want to have to defer more money. I want to look after my own. And if the future player or the younger generation of National Hockey League players has to make up that shortfall, either in this agreement or outside of the agreement, the six-year CBA extension, I'm fine with that. Well, what do you think your position would have been? Well, it's hard to be, um, uh, you know, a grand thinker as you see the the road getting short in front of you. Yeah. You know, you've only got so much time to play. You've only got, you know, you've got the money you're going to make is sitting right in front of you. I think, Dregs, what helps this a little bit is there's been a, a shift in the way guys get paid. Mm-hmm. When I was playing, you used to get paid for what you've done, what you've accomplished. Now you get paid on your potential. So for most of the older guys, they've already seen this shift take place. Yeah. And um, I'll, I'll use a guy just because I like the way he plays and just, you know, um, he doesn't have, he's got less career in front of him than behind. That's Claude Giroux. Yeah. So Giroux's not an especially older guy and he makes $8.25 million and he's going to take a pretty good haircut here, but it's pretty hard for him to go. I need to worry about the 20 year olds. And I'm just yeah. using him as an example. I yeah. don't know Claude other than to say hi to him, but I don't, you know, so I don't, it's not like I got any knowledge. It is the, the PA of course comes, their view is to support and protect all players. There's a hundred splinters inside that PA just on where you are of your age, the point of your career, the caliber of player you are, um, your free agency status. You were, you were talking on insider trading about the tolling of seasons, which allow, Mm -hmm. you know, free agency to be accrued and all that, man, there's a million things that start to seep a little water through the PA because everybody has to look after themselves because there's one thing that I, I know for sure when you're out, you are out. Nobody ever says to you, Oh yeah, by the way, we found some more money. Here's some more money for you. You're out, you're gone. Yeah. So there's a couple of ways that I think are important to look at this because we now are very clear on it's a business. Mm-hmm. Don't look at Austin Matthews and Connor McDavid who are losing 27% of $10 million this year. It's a crazy amount of money, man. Crazy. Look at the guys making 750000 They might only play for a year or two. Once they pay their escrow and their taxes, man, they're in, a, they're in a far different world. And so you can see where the tug of war begins, ends, and continues. And it's been that way forever. Canadian division is going to be interesting for a lot of different reasons. And we've already touched on yep. this in the podcast where we think, okay, for a one-off, one season, just through necessity, yeah, we'll have fun with it. Why not? Embrace the rivalries. Sure. Um, but just because of, of the logistics of having to, to fly and, and get as many games in as you can, obviously, you know, the, the Toronto Maple Leafs go to, the, to Vancouver to play the Vancouver Canucks, if allowed to do so. You know, they're going to play two games in Vancouver, maybe three. You mm-hmm. have a three-game series against a Canadian opponent. Do you think it's going to be playoff atmosphere, like a playoff series, or by game three, it's either going to be feisty because you're sick of one another, or it's going to be a flat out dud? 
Uh, I think it'll be feisty and I think it'll be a mini playoff series. That's how the coaches will sell it to their teams. Hey, look, we're playing. If you're, if you're Travis green, you know, we're playing Toronto three times. We need to win two out of three games. If you're Sheldon Keefe, we've split the first two games. That third game for the Leafs is critical. I only played three games in a row against the team in the regular season one time. I'm not sure how it happened. Uh, I'm not sure if the people at the NHL had a map or not. But anyway, Washington and Atlanta played three straight games. By the end of the three games, um, I had a note through our general manager, Don Waddell, uh, from Gary Bettman, <laughs> telling me to zip it on the schedule in, <laughs> in certain terms. Uh, we also had a note, uh, both myself and Ron Wilson, who was coaching in Washington, to stop what was going on in the papers back and forth, because the thing turned into a war. The, the third game was a gong show. It was brutal. And there ended up in a brawl and Brendan Witt had suckered Andrew Brunette. And there was a five on five brawl. I was yelling at Wilson over their players onto the bench. It was, it was not good. Actually, as I look back, it was really entertaining. Perfect. However, at the time it was not good, but those games, that third game, I think more often than not will have, I'm tired of you. I have to play against you again. And it will be, it will have some zip that sometimes misses. I wouldn't want it to be all the time, but yeah. I, if that's the case, Drake's, we're going to get some good stuff. All right. Those are your headlines brought to you by Legaro Jewelers. You can visit Legaro Jewelers at legaro.com. Use code Ray10 to get a 10% discount as you continue to do your holiday season shopping. Ray, our interview with Ryan Whitney is coming up and it is presented by CoolBet.com. Uh, and our pal there, Chris Abbott, winter is in the air. We know this certainly is in Ontario. We talked about this earlier with my damn windows open. Uh, hockey getting ready to come back. The NFL is getting down to the final last couple of weeks for the playoffs, and it's all happening at coolbet.co. It's where you can play exciting sports, top casino games for free. You must be 19, and Coolbet reminds you to stay cool. Always bet responsible. Okay, it's become an episode by episode staple now. And and look, we weren't going to do throat punch every week, but it feels like we've got enough. We've got lots of candidates. Who's kidding? Who? Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah. In, including ourselves. Westy nominated us, uh, I believe, on Twitter oh. because yeah, only because eh, season two took a little while to get going. He's a big fan of the Rain Dregs podcast, so Westy is throat punching all of us. So I, I don't blame you. I certainly don't blame myself. So I, 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 I blame Rob Gray and all the behind the scenes people. Well, I mean, I had a legit physical excuse, you know, I had new knee put in. Yeah. You were moving to a new house. Clearly until today, you didn't know how the damn blinds worked in your house. Fair. So you had lots going on. I'm not sure what those other guys were doing. Do you have, apologize? Do you, I, I, I've got a, I, well, I have at least one throat paw, uh, punch candidate, and, and I'll, I'll pair them together for two, but uh, I'm going to let you go first. Who's your throat punch candidate this week? Okay, I don't know the guy's name. I can't remember it, but I'm, my throat punch is for that jackass that w robbed Walter Gretzky. So this guy had gotten to know Walter at various golf tournaments, kind of cozied up to him so that he was able to kind of befriend Walter, end up going to the house, right. stealing stuff out of his house. Walter knows the guy, and yeah. this clown steals it and then sells the memorabilia that he's stolen out into the market. Well, once the, the theft was reported, they ask the memorabilia dealers, hey, is there any new Gretzky memorabilia on the, on the market? It was pretty easy for them to find. So not only does this guy get arrested, which he should, 
but he should get several throat punches for just being a jackass. He took advantage of Walter Gretzky, befriended him, and then stole out of his house. That's yeah. my throat punch. Not to make a comparison, although it ranks up there for me with the feces flinging debacle moron from episode or from season one. Remember the 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 knucklehead in Toronto. I mean, how low do you have to get or be to rob Walter Gretzky? I mean, well, especially quick. especially after he's befriended him. Yeah, and you're clearly doing that so you can take advantage yeah what an ass man yeah that's a terrific candidate um and i don't think i can top that but i don't know that that's the essence of throat punch anyway we just throw out candidates no, no it's just who do you want to throw punch last week it was the guy that ground up your lawn yeah yeah that still bugs me um throat punch this week episode two season two is either logan paul or jake paul just just pick a Paul. It, it really doesn't matter. I'm appalled by all that's going on. Mm. <laughs> I worked on that for weeks. Now, uh, I just, I, I, I guess what I don't understand <clears throat> is, have we as a society reached a point where we're so bored in a pandemic that we're paying hard earned money to watch these guys, influencers, People with social media clout fight highly respected fighters. Like, why would Mayweather engage in any of this? I don't understand, other than he's going to make, what, another 100, 150 million, I guess, because there are going to be dopes out there who buy this package. Um, right. So I, I, I don't know if I'm throat punching the Pauls or if I'm throat punching anybody who's going to pay the 80 bucks to get this pay-per-view. I don't, I don't understand it. But it bugs me, and uh, I, you know, we should have. I, it just it, it it bothers me that a highly respected fighter like Mayweather would would take the bait on this. I don't understand why you would do it. Yeah, I, it's cash, man. Boredom, like what? Like I don't care how old. Like how old Floyd Mayweather? Do you know offhand? I, I, I want, can you I, imagine? I think 47, something like that. I could be wrong. But okay, that's... I was just going to say, though, could you imagine how fast he still is? Oh. Like, it's not like it's not like all of a sudden Floyd May, Mayweather's, you know, doesn't know how to throw a punch anymore. No. Like, I, I don't know. That fight could be going on in my driveway, and I wouldn't know it was going on. Yeah. There is zero chance that I'll I'll be watching it. You know who I'd watch fight him though? Fight the Pauls? Who? Evander Kane. <laughs> because Evander and him, they've been going back and forth too. Right? And I'm because it's got a hockey connection, I go, yeah, I would watch that. Yeah. And I'm guessing that wouldn't be close. No. And then that took it that unfortunate. Would be quick. That took an unfortunate twist as well, right? Because then Ryan Reeves got involved and there was some banter back and forth that uh, Evander yeah. Kane regrets and, and all of those things. But I just, okay, so, so and if you're Evander Kane's spouse, general manager, whoever, like, are you not saying, look, Evander, what are you doing? Just leave him alone. Stop <laughs> it. I know you're, you're, you're frustrated by it. We're all frustrated by it. But I'm not going to fight one of the Pauls. Now, they kick my ass for starters. I was going to say because we would lose. <laughs> but I just don't know why. Like I'm not engaging. I guess I am to some degree because we're, I'm throat punching. We're having this conversation on a public yeah. platform. I just don't. I, I don't quite get it. I'm not going to lie. Well, I just know that I'm not paying for it. No. By the way, I got a question for you. Yeah. Just finish my water bottle. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to put it in the recycling. Yeah. Right. When you put a bottle in the recycling, do you just put it in like this or do you crinkle it up like this? Because I always crinkle it up. I don't know. I don't know why that I do that. I cannot throw a bottle into the recycling unless it's crumpled up. Uh, well, what do you do? That's, I, I do exactly the same thing. Uh, and I think you're being respectful of our environment. That's what you're doing because you can jam. But hang on, you realize 
hang on, you you realize that when it gets to the recycling thing, the thing that crushes it up, it's far more powerful than your hand. I understand that, Ray, but think about it. When you crumple up the bottle, you've now squeezed sure. all the air out, so it's a third of its size. So now you can get three times as many crushed bottles into that recycling bin, right? Or into the bag that then goes into the crusher. I do the same thing. I'll take a picture of it and send it to you. So oh, on, occasion, on occasion, I've had a Bud Light, you know? I, I, I socially <laughs> distance. I have a couple of buddies who have been in the bubble here. Uh, we socially distance. And I, I went to... Uh, Princess Auto, that was the name of the place. And I bought a can crusher. And that's the very reason why. Why would you throw uh, a, 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 like an empty can of beer mm -hmm. or pop or whatever and take up all that space when you can crush it down to that size? And it, it serves two purposes. I don't have to unload the recycling as often because more cans go into the recycling bin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. See, you've got more cans into the bag. That's why. Well, here's, you know what, Drake's? It's amazing what you find out in just 30 it's, seconds. I didn't realize you had a passion for can crushing. I didn't know. I, I'm interested. I do it with milk cartons too. We finish our almond milk. Oh, that thing's got to be squeezed right down. Cammy just throws a whole carton in there. I got to squeeze it back down. I don't do that because I'm not a milk drinker. So I don't care what happens to the milk cartons. Well, we got a we got an eleven and a fourteen year old. They yeah. they drink they drink it like it's you know like it's going out of style. Well, no hockey, uh, global pandemic. We've got Ryan Whitney taking some time to join us. Huge role in the success of one of the top sports podcasts in the world, literally. Spit and checklets. So, uh, Ryan, thanks for doing this. And and before we get going, and I'm going to jump on Ray here because Ray would be the first to chirp you. But I got to be careful. So I'm seeing the Pink Whitney logo and everything behind you. And and for those who are following us from Russia, yeah, I was. That's what I was going to ask you about. I mean, for anyone who follows yeah. us, subscribes on YouTube, they can see it. Um, is that a fireman's hat? Is it a police cap? This what is was that? um play. It was actually. Uh, we were playing Torpedo. I don't, is it Nova, Nova Grode? I don't know the city, but it's Torpedo because uh, Woltek All right, Wolski, that was your KHL year, right? Yes, Woltek Wolski was on the team and we were walking in and there was a giant Russian, he must have been police officer with this hat. I was like, your hat, your hat's unbelievable. He's like, your stick, your stick. So after the game, I gave him a twig and he gave me this hat. Now it probably has lice, but still it's pretty sick. <laughs> That is outstanding. So when yeah. you're when you're playing there, like do you you know you said like is it Novogard or whatever? Did you even know like where you were going half the time or like or who no. you're playing or do you just play? No, it's really right? funny because you know, like you're playing in the NHL or growing up, doesn't matter what league you're in, you know, you know what, what you're getting into most nights. You know, you're playing a team that's that struggles you're like ah tonight shouldn't be too hard it's just it's like human nature if you're going in and playing the blues in st louis it's like we better be ready so we're going around i have no idea like the history of any teams besides besides red army and then and then ska uh st petersburg because they were like crushing everyone you know we're going to we're going to um what was the one city we went to a more like near china and I'm like, what the hell? And somebody's like, yeah, apparently this team's pretty fast. So it was just, you'd get on the ice and just kind of hope that it was pretty easy to figure out early on. And sometimes it wasn't. I, I went to Ufa and they, I don't know if they were in the league then when you we played were there. there. But, great rink. But that felt like great rink, but it was so far and it was so cold and it felt like you were on the moon. Oh, it's, and I don't know, like. I guess if you're trading for a cop's hat, you are on the moon a little bit, no? Oh, I, I wasn't on a uh, planet Earth. I'll tell you that it was it was I, <laughs> the my months there. I was in another galaxy. I'll say. I'll say. I, I remember. I would just was it, like. Was it? Go ahead. Oh, I was just say. Was it fun? Was it, it was? It was fun. Like it, you it know, was, it was a grind. And I, I said um, to everyone, like when I'm there, I just couldn't wait to get home. I'm not going to lie. Like I was going there, I was making some money. I knew the, the, my career was ending, but 
once I started playing, it was a blast. And the games were so fun. I said to everyone, every game, the crowds, you know what European hockey like, Russia, how much it matters. I loved playing. It was it was away from the rink. I was just I missed American or Canadian food. I missed uh, friends. It was uh, it is what it is. But looking back, like I wouldn't change a thing. I'm so happy I went. And I missed training camp. I told everyone there's no chance I'm going to training camp. They go like July 2nd and it's 60 <laughs> days long. They do double sessions skating still. Oh, now, when you came to the NHL, were they still doing doubles or had that long gone? We might have had the occasional, you'd have to go back to work out. But no, actually, because we were just talking, Biz and I came in with Pittsburgh and um, we remember the test thing. We, 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 it was go, go do push-ups with, with another guy and tell us how many you did. It was like the easiest <laughs> thing in the world, Penguins camp in 2005. I don't, so I don't think we were coming back then. But I, I don't think anyone of, of my buddies I remember coming in the league were doing double sessions on ice. Unless I'm blanking that up, blacking that out of my memory. Well, I know we did it and it sucked because you'd come <laughs> back and your your gear was wet and it stunk. Ah. And then they'd be like, yeah, we're just going to be on for 90 minutes in the afternoon. Oh. You're like, oh, it was like torture. So you were, what was your first camp? What year is that? Uh, 84. And that's, and, and that's long before the, whatever it is now, the three hour rule. You probably had a oh, average I, seven, nine hour, eight hour day. Like these guys now, like they're, know, they're like, amazing. Oh, we got to go back and we got to be here to stretch and to work out. I'm like, Pfft. like we just, we got ground into the ground with one guy, my first camp, I get on the scale. I'm 164 pounds. I'm a little skinny, little rat. The guy in front of me, you know, you got into groups of five to go do your, whatever your blood pressure and all that he gets on. He's 242 pounds. I'm 164. <laughs> and they say to him, hey, you got 30 days to lose 30 pounds. He's like, no problem. And he got off the scale. They were moving that metal thing like ding, ding, <laughs> ding, ding to get. You're like, geez, they start just at zero. They don't even go to 100 for you. <laughs> they get a little rat. Okay, so I'm still staring at the hat. Yeah. yeah like hat. every time you see that, you must, <laughs> it must take you back to. Just how, how the hell that all, how did you get to Russia? Like, I, I know how, it was why uh, there. I actually, uh, who was I talking to recently? The kid, Tim Stapleton who played, he was really good in Russia. He played all over Europe. And, um, I, I was in the minors the year before I got sent down, not claiming waivers, played in San Antonio. I, I couldn't get a contract. I went to St. Louis on a tryout for the second year in a row, which the year prior was when Biz and I were together. And, <laughs> Nothing came of it. Like it was, it was just, you know, I went there maybe you get signed by an AHL team. I wasn't ready to retire. My ankle was so messed up. I, I was half the player I, I, I was when I was younger and, and decent, but I started calling around f trying to find a European agent. I'm thinking like, all right, well, I, I'd love to go play in Switzerland. Like you think because you played a little while in the NHL, you can just go to Switzerland. Dude, try again. There's like three imports on every team. I think it's the best job in the world yeah. trying to get in there. So I had no chance getting in there. I had a chance with some team, but ended up falling through. And then all of a sudden there's a team in Germany or there's a, a Red Bull team in Austria. And I was like, I don't know, because all of a sudden there was Sochi from the KHL. And the guy's like, listen, it's pretty good money. Um, I think it was like 600, 700 grand. And I was there for 40 <laughs> games. I was like, all right. Uh, I mean... And everyone told me that everyone told crazy. me like, you won't. They're like you won't last. You love you, you diva. You won't last. And so I'm like, all right, I I have to stay over there too. I can't come home. I'll be. I'll never hear the end of it. And then all of a sudden, I was there, and the team was struggling. But we got in the playoffs, and it was a first year team, first year program in the KHL. So we got swept by Red Army and Radulov. But it was still, it was a good experience. Who was coaching you there? Butsayev, I don't remember his first name, maybe Slava. He played over in North America for a little while. Yeah. He was crazy. I mean, he you could tell he had pretty good skill when he was out there like doing the drills, but he would just scream at everyone and the, the practices would be three hours because he'd blow the whistle every time. And then the guy coaching the D was, um, what's his first name? Gusarov won a Stanley Cup with the... Oh, Alexi. Alexi Gusarov. Alexi Gusarov? Was it Alexi? I think that was his son's... I don't know. I don't know. I'll Google it. Well, this guy, Wait, was, he was, so he was an NHL guy coaching you like, yes, but, so did but he that's feel not, like an NHL guy? No, or no, 
No, Alexi Gusarov, yes. That's what was weird. I was like, oh, man, this guy played in the NHL. This will be nice because sometimes the, the imports would mention to me, the Russian coaches. I mean, there's no language, and there's also, like, a certain way that they do things over there. So I was like, oh, I'll get an NHL guy. Gusarov, he was the exact same as all the other Russian coaches. Just rotate through the 6D, sometimes 8D. You get whoever was up for the power play. I'm like, what's going on right now? So, you know, at some points we got a power play unit together. And other times it was like, I was like, this guy was 10 times the player I was, a Stanley Cup champion for the Avalanche on this amazing team. And he sees these practices we're doing and doesn't think to like, hey, it's probably a little ridiculous to blow the whistle every seven seconds while they're trying to do a drill. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah no kidding so you you've referenced paul beeson at a couple of times uh, obviously you've known him a long time dating back to your playing days uh in in pittsburgh is there anything you guys talk about everything on spit and chicklets i mean there's yeah. are there boundaries on that podcast number one and number two tell us something about biz that nobody else would know hmm um boundaries <laughs> You guys know now with what you can and can't say, it's certainly changed. I mean, I remember yeah. the first time Biz came on as a guest. I, I would actually love to go listen to that episode. I, I, he was ridiculous. He was Biz. I mean, he's <laughs> he's electric. He'll talk about anything. I remember then, like now Biz has a girl. He's, he's wifed up. He's very happy, but it's a little different. I remember him saying like sex sells. He like knew like people were interested in some of these stories of him running wild because he was so authentic. And he's so he's the um, he's just a, a great guy. Like it's it's hard to put into words how much he means to me. He's a great friend. I think of him like family. In terms of what uh, what uh, people wouldn't know about him, oh my God, there's so many things. You should try having a conversation with this guy at dinner. He'll be on his phone the whole time. You'll just talk, and then you'll stop talking because he's on his phone. And then finally he'll be like, Oh, he stopped talking. Wait, why'd you stop talking? I'm like, cause you're not listening to it. He's like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Then there'll be like four people, <laughs> people and he's on his, on his phone, on his phone. There's three guys talking and he just butts into the conversation. I'm like, biz, we were, we're not even talking about that anymore. He's like, Oh, I heard that, but I was texting. It's like, you got to ask anyone who knows him to get his attention is nearly impossible. But once you get it, he's all in. <laughs> But he's, okay, you know what he'll say to me? It, he's like, hey, I'm, I'm making you money. I'm doing deals. I'm like, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, keep going. <laughs> okay, so speaking of making money and being all in, I just see that latest commercial for the gloves where he's got his ass hanging out. Oh. What are the chances that there's a part two to this commercial and you're in it? I, I can't act. I, I've been in the, the Pink Whitney in the New Amsterdam commercial with him, which first off, I don't know if you guys know the story. We get out to L.A. to film it and they give us these scripts of what they want us to say. It was just so not us. Like it was, you know, it was just like the corniest. Like we just never would have said it. And Biz says we can't say these things. So Biz wrote, boom. He literally told told me and decided what he was going to say for each commercial. So he's very like. He's creative like yes. that. Like yeah. he's just like got an interesting mind where he's able to think of ideas and he's good at acting. I'm terrible at it. It's so unnatural to me. To him, he's able to turn it on. So that's why Watson, when they when they uh, signed Biz to do that commercial, whatever it was, I, they gave him full freedom to just do whatever they wanted. They paid him something. <laughs> they told him the product and he, they were like, go ahead. So he's able to do that. I don't think I can make an appearance in the second one because he outacts me so bad. I look like a <laughs> fool. <laughs> I need it to stay real life with him so I can outsmart him, but you don't have the chance to do that in a <laughs> fake commercial. <laughs> hey, I, I just, you know, so like you go through and you meet all these characters in your career, right? And then you connect with Biz. And he told, he was on and told us a story how you guys sort of kind of came up with what this could be. Did you ever even imagine that it would be this? Oh, no, no chance. I never imagined uh, we'd have anyone to listen that listen because uh, it was R.A. and myself who, who started it. And I remember tweeting out, I, I would love, I said, I, I'm thinking about starting a podcast. Uh, what do you think, Biz Nasty? He writes me back, I'm still playing when I'm done for sure. So I said, oh, I'll start doing it. And R.A. hops on. Now, R.A. had a connection with Barstool and like he'd been a Bruins blogger and I'd met him once, maybe twice, but I didn't really know him. Looking back, it's crazy. I, I wouldn't think, let's go have lunch <laughs> before you just start a podcast. Right. But that was kind of my expectations. I was like, I no one, I, I was like, I remember I was like embarrassed to tell people, I'm like, oh, I'm doing a podcast. First of all, they're like, what's that? 
second of all, I said, I don't know. I'm just going right. to talk about hockey, what's going on in the league. And they're like, oh, that's cool. And I remember being told like a couple buddies of mine said, hey, my, my friend or my, my uh, brother-in-law listened. He thought it was a great show. I was like, oh, my God. It was like the best feeling in the world. You, you're mm-hmm. here because you're just you're, you're just trying to be like authentic and talk about something you love. And, and for people for people to enjoy it is like it's the most shocking thing ever. And in, in a sense, like I, I would never, ever expect to have had any of this success let alone what it is i remember thinking i'm never gonna make money from this i was like oh I don't people do get paid i'm like no <laughs> but I, I think a lot of times to start something that's good and you guys know like rape your your hockey career like you just you love it it's like a passion and i really do love doing this because when i talk to former players that i never knew and i got to play against or even didn't get to play against before me it's like every hockey player has so many similarities that you really do feel like you're back talking with the guys in the locker room. That's what I miss most about playing. Yeah. Oh, by far. Like where else can you, you know, have the shenanigans that you did. Yeah. That you can't go into a, a meeting now and be like you were in the locker room. Right. Like, of course that, that can't happen. And then you end up with pink Whitney, which yeah, that's, cracks me up to no end to see your name on a on a banner like that yeah there's somebody that sent me um i don't know if it was the lcbo or some liquor online description of the drink is that uh lemonade pink lemonade flavored vodka inspired by nhl legend ryan whitney (laughs) (laughs) i started laughing i'm like in 30 years some kid's gonna read this he's gonna hockey db me and be like legend what the fuck? <laughs> gonna, man, is that kid gonna be disappointed? <laughs> They're like, what the what was when did the term legend describe a plug? I, I I think that's so funny. But the drink, yeah, that was biz. Uh that was biz and my wife. Biz said we gotta try to make this when when it took off online. We're driving to a costume party with my wife. I said, You should see all these tweets we're getting. Pink Whitney, Pink Whitney. She said, Why don't you try to make it like make a drink? And I was like, oh, if both you guys are saying this, then let's let's try to do it. I also was embarrassed then in a sense, like, why the hell would anyone put pink my name on a drink biz? Nobody's going to buy it. It's going to be embarrassing when you like look and see there's they've sold seven bottles in the first six months <laughs> and, and five of them were bought by my parents. <laughs> well, it sold a lot more than that, man. It's yeah. been outrageous. Yeah, it's crazy. It's uh, I think that Barstool's so also right there in terms of like why this is where it is podcast and pink whitney because their reach is is out of control and they've been so awesome to work with so what do you what's you know you keep doing the show like what's where do you go where does what's what's next like i've thought about that it's kind of cool we've gotten into some video content especially the golf where we've done some sandbaggers um we start off, got to play Crosby and McKinnon. So you, you'll probably never really reach the first episode again in terms of talent, <laughs> but it's still been fun because that's something that we can do. And we can also get guys like uh, personalities out there, even in a better, like I mean, a better example of how they are. Even when they interview us, when you're out on the golf course and you're in a cart with a teammate, then you really get guys competitive juices flowing. And the videos have been really fun for me to do. But terms of the pod, yeah, I, I got no chance, no turn, no idea of like slowing down or thought of slowing down. We went, we were doing two episodes a week, and I think the show struggled a little bit. I, I just think like once a week. I know that there's some things during an NHL season that may won't if the, if we're recording Monday and it happens Tuesday, yeah. a week later it's not that fresh. Yeah. But still, uh, uh, there'll be enough where we, we're giving our best two and a half hours once a week. We're doing good interviews and we're staying, I think, more fresh and more involved, at least personally. I know I'm 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 too lazy. I can't I can't work like five days a week. I don't know how you guys do that. Savages <laughs> well, people out there if, with that work ethic. <laughs> yeah, but if you're working that much, then you can't work on your golf game. Exactly. But right now we got a blizzard. So I'm like, I'll do 17 podcasts that. today if you want. <laughs> OK, so where, where's your golf game at? What's your cap? Golf game's solid right now. I had a great year. Um, it's a zero right now. So I was at, oh. I, I got it. It was a plus. It was like a plus one and a half at one point, which definitely isn't me, but I played real well. And you know, the handicap, at least in the States, they switched it. So it changes every day. Instead of two weeks, now you post a score next day, it's updated. Yeah. So I had played like nice rounds in a row where I probably, I was probably 
between three under and two over like 10 rounds in a row. So wow, that's I, a good stretch. It, you know, it really dropped down. And then like golf, you guys know it's the most tapped game in the world. All of a sudden you have it, you have a feel, you're like, when am I going to ever lose this? And then the next day you're spraying <laughs> balls, right. And you can't make a putt and you're, you're hitting balls thin. It's like, so I've kind of gotten better, I think, because mentally wise, it's so different than hockey that you just have to have so much patience and you have to have like so much freedom in your swing where you're not worried and pissed off that you're playing so bad that you're just trying to free yourself up to just put a good swing on it. And the more I've got less mad, the better I've become. I used to get so pissed off. I used to play this kid. He's become a good buddy. I call him the one arm bandit. He puts one handed. He's played in three U.S. Come. mid-ams. He's a legitimate stick, Andrew Duramio. He used to take me. He must have taken 30 grand off me when I started playing. <laughs> I met this kid 10 years ago, and I was, a, I was a 15 handicap. He would give me seven and seven or eight and eight and just whoop me every time. So it helped me get better because I took my beatings. I had to pay for it, but I was playing with a good player. And he says now, he's like, you used to flip out. You'd make three pars in a row, hit a bad tee ball, break a club. And, and since I've gotten yeah. over that like childish aspect, even though it still comes out, I, I've definitely gotten better. But I'm obsessed with the game. Obsessed. I started uh, a few years ago going on on golf trips and getting to go to Europe to play in these incredible oh. places. Not all the time, but like every couple of years. And I got this. I at this course. I don't know if you've ever played at Royal County Down in yeah, we play. in uh, Ireland. So I run into this caddy. And it's a bit of a long thing to, or longer thing to get to the point. But so this guy is about five, nine, my, my size, wide, thick as a house. So he's my caddy. I notice he's got on the back of his calf, which is like a house, a tattoo that says, hate the world. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> well, that's kind of, <laughs> this is kind of interesting. Turns out he's a former uh, rugby player. And so, of course, he's a beast, right? He looks up my, it, it, we play 36 holes. He looks up um, my, you know, my Wikipedia, whatever. He finds out, hey, you, you played hockey. You played, they called you little ball of hate. And he's like, oh, no wonder we get along. Like, I love the guy. So he tells me we're in the second nine. He goes, you know what your problem is? You care too much. Yep. He's like, you hit a bad shot screw it, man. Like just I'll find it and hit it again. We went back two years later. I run into him again, man. This guy is like, it's such great golf advice. Just care less. We're you, not going to be on TV. The more I, I play with this guy, Jim Renner, who's played on tour. Um, right now he's on the, the corn ferry tour and he's got the most amazing mental like approach to golf. He, he, he cares and he loves the game and he works, but he doesn't care. And he hits like he'll hit a horrible shot. He just he just laughs. He doesn't give a shit. He doesn't worry that what if I hit my next one like that? So yeah. to watch that stuff certainly helps me. But golf is like so what's your go ahead? What's your goal with golf? Could you play in a mid am? Could you could you qualify uh, I think, one I think day for ultimate, an open? My ultimate dream in a goal in golf is to play in a US mid am, which the winner of that tournament plays in the Masters. I have no uh, expectations I could ever win a U.S. Mid-Am. And most of the guys who do win those are former pros that got their amateur status back. They were mm. never elite PGA Tour pros for the most part, but they're guys who are their entire life, they were playing golf the way I was playing hockey. And then they become amateurs and they go on. But to get into one, it's one round. It's one qualifying round. And if you go and shoot even or one under or two under, you got a good chance of just qualifying. Now, a U.S. Open, you got to get through one round local 36 hole sectional. I've never thought of that because getting in that tournament, I'd be so out of my league, but a U.S. mid-am to get in, that's the goal. So I've played in some state ams and some other things, but never a USGA event. That would be cool. Now I've, we follow, of course, but so we're watching the U S open and everybody's writing about the and what he's going to do. And, and you're, of course, Big you're fan. all over him. Look at him. He's minus or he's plus 22. Cause he says the course is a par 68. <laughs> But like, is it, are you amazed at all? Or are you just kind of, you think it's ridiculous the way that he's trying to play? Cause I'm kind I, of amazed that he thinks he can do this. I'm, I'm, I have like every thought on that guy. I think he's a complete clown, but I also am so 
impressed and amazed by what he did. Like he actually physically changed his body. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I mean, the, the fact that he was able to gain that much weight and look at it and say, listen, I'm going to hit it further than everyone. And then I'm going to wedge it close. And because the guy's one of the sickest putters, nobody talks about, it. he's one of the best putters I've ever yeah. seen. Mm -hmm. And so he went about this crazy way. Not only did he do the, not only did he make the changes to his body, but he dealt with all the noise of people being like, look at this idiot. What is this guy doing? He's already won on tour a bunch. Now he's like gaining 40 pounds. It made no sense. But as I think he's a clown, it's like some of the stuff this guy's pulled off this year. He fought. He fought with the guy about the fire ants. You remember he wanted to drop because yeah. the ball was on the fire ants. He, he, you know, he's chirping Brooks Kepka on a Twitch stream, which whatever can be fun. But then Kepka dummied him, sent him the picture of the four major trophies. Remember he said I don't, he doesn't have a six pack. He goes, yeah, I'm, I'm too short. Sends him his PGAs and his U.S. Opens. So Deschambeau, I think he has zero awareness, like. Of, of like how he comes off publicly, but he doesn't seem to care. He's him winning that open was, that was just, I mean, I've played wing foot. I've played wing foot. It's impossible. He's just bombing it over trees. It certainly isn't the most yeah. fun thing to watch as a viewer, but you, I, I have to respect yeah. it. I do. Will you check out Charlie Woods this week? Oh yeah. I was seeing that kid swing. Imagine your dad's tiger. That's Sick. tough though. That's tough though, oh. man. Like, because that kid has the dreams of looking what his dad did, and it'll never happen again. But still, his swing is so money. What's he, 11? Yeah, he's not yeah, isn't the, that yeah. sweet? That is such a sweet swing. There's a great picture. I saw him and Tiger are both at the kind of the top of their backswing, and they got the same club angle, and the hands are in the same place. I'm Identical. Like, that's ridiculous, man. Yeah, and Tiger has a Tiger has a huge range in his yard in Jupiter. Yeah. And so the kids are kids just growing up hitting balls in the Tiger Woods yeah. every day <laughs> after school. Hey, Witt, I got to ask you about uh, uh, because I'm not sure you were there, but I, I think you were. I think you were playing in Pittsburgh when Michelle Terrian took over. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. So I'm there doing a game for the Oilers and you guys lose to Edmonton. Oh yeah. He comes out and we're standing there and he says in his French accent, right? Like he's, I think these guys are trying to be the worst defense in the national hockey league. Were, were you part of that team? Yes. Yes, I was. And, and there's a lot that goes into that. Cause story. I was blown away by that. There's a lot that goes into that story because, um, Horkoff had a hat trick, I think. Tyrion comes in and just soft, soft, just rips us apart. I had been with him in the AHL and then I got called up and then Edzo got fired and then Tyrion got the job. And like he, it was an exact opposite of what had been going on. I mean, he was hard on guys. He brought Ryan Malone in first meeting and never really met him and just brought him down and goes, I'm not here to coach rock stars and sent him out and then scratched him for the first three games, I think. <laughs> so, so there was an immediate impact. So he came in and he was pissed off and we were, weren't a very good team, but he certainly got the most out of us by the end of that year. And that game was embarrassing. We then, uh, I, we then went to Columbus and he ripped us there too. And we lost seven, nothing there. And we, we gave up a goal like eight seconds into the game. It, everyone was so <laughs> rattled by him just carving us. <laughs> At least the defenseman were, he was just carving all the D. <laughs> Cause I've never heard a coach wow. talk like that. And I was standing in the little scrum and I was like, Oh, he oh, just said no. they're trying to be the worst defense in the league. <laughs> yeah, he had some he had some amazing chirps and he wasn't afraid to say anything uh, to anyone. It's a little right. different now. So I think we can talk about this because you talk about anything. Um, but let's fast forward to 2010. You're on the US Olympic team. I mean, you guys did great. Uh, not as good as Canada, but you did pretty well. You <laughs> wanna, had one and one against them. Yeah. Silver medal. <laughs> um, now Taylor Hall goes first overall to the Edmonton Oilers in 2010, not summer, right? So I remember, I'll let you tell the story, but you're in uh, Toronto, you're at TSN, you're a guest panelist for yes. a, a playoff run after the fact, and you tell a great story of a dinner involving Taylor Hall, you're a veteran with the Edmonton Oilers, just post-Olympics, and it would be his NHL rookie year. So tell us about that dinner and the exchange and how Taylor – barely barely survived that dinner alive 
No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Halsey just Halsey had some swagger to him when he came into the league. I loved it. I mean, he was so good and he was like able to kind of give it back to guys. So he was he like chirped me one time and we were out to dinner or something, just kind of being like now I was probably trying to be like cool veteran to him, being being tough guy. So we're out to dinner and, and I think Horkoff said to him, like, Halsey, you can't be chirping guys. Like Whit played in the Olympics. You're chirping him. And he's like, What he played three minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like you, mo- you mother. <laughs> He's like 18 years old. Obviously, he'd watched every second. He's like, I didn't even see that guy make any play out there besides maybe a turnover. So he he wasn't afraid. To we we ended up becoming such good buddies. Yeah. I lived with him and Ebbs the next year, I think, or two years later. I don't remember. But he yeah, he gave it to me. He I, I didn't have much. What am I going to say to the first of all pick? It was chirp me, but riding the pine in the Olympics. <laughs> that's tremendous yeah that was classic i loved hanging Man, out with Hall, Hall and eberly those guys it's crazy neither one of them are there and there's the team still struggles but it was so fun to, to be with them as they came into the league because they were doing crazy things i mean halsey had tr- trouble staying healthy eberly's rookie year i mean the first the kid's first nhl goal was one of the best i've ever seen yeah you must have felt older on that team, eh? Oh, yeah, I did. I did. That was when I realized, I mean, oh, I'm, and there were some older guys than me, but we had a huge difference between guys like, uh, I don't know, 32 and up, and then 18 to 23. It was like yeah. there weren't many guys right in between there. That was when the ankle was really becoming a problem, too, wasn't it, Whit? It, was, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't that bad because the best year I was having in my career is when I blew it out for the, blew out my right one. And um, I had I had started the year as well as ever. Our team wasn't playing well, but personally, I was playing a lot and playing good. And then that went and I was like, oh, my God, And that was a major surgery. I was out five months, I think. And after that came back, it was never the same. Both of them were kind of messed up. But then to have the right one really go bad was tough. Those teams stuff barking at you. Yeah, it is actually I got to get the the, I had the left foot surgery, which is an osteotomy I had on both feet which is really like not a common surgery. And they break, they, they break the bone. They take a piece of the bone out to try to make your high arches lower. So that makes any sense listening on a podcast, but it, it was, it was nuts. And so the left one was the first one I did and the guy kind of overcorrected it. So now I'm walking around on a foot that feels like I, I'm walking on like a, a marble or a pebble, but it's just my bone. So I got to get surgery on that. But I got to wait till next October because that's the end of golf season. I don't want to miss like yes. four months of golf. So I'll get it end of October, November, December, January, February. I'll be ready for April. <laughs> hey, uh, I, I hear you. I just got knee replacement surgery in oh. September. I was limping. I was limping around the wit and I'm like, I am not losing golf season this year. No. So I got all the way to the end of September and, and I'm I'm ready. I'll be ready to go for sure. How that? How that? Those are pretty Planet. smooth surgeries now, right? Like you're in and out. They are, but it sucks. Yeah, I was out in a day, but it sucks, man. Yeah. Like it, it hurt. The first month was hard, and uh, we got an 11 and a 13 year old. And my wife basically had to do everything. Baby, three of us. No. Oh, I was oh. useless. Useless. I'm such a wuss. I just couldn't <laughs> do it. <laughs> yeah. Look at me. <laughs> All right, we're, we're, we're going to let you go. Uh, you've been kind enough to spend a good chunk of time with us here. But uh, first Any of all, time. What, anytime, fellas. What's the holiday season looking like? I mean, it's tough. It's cool. Yeah. What are you going to do? I, it won't be a typical Whitney clan sort of no. holiday East festival in Boston, will it? No, not this year. It's um, usually a big New Year, uh, Christmas Eve at my wife's family's house. Her mom throws a big shindig. This year, it's just going to be chill, kind of same way Thanksgiving was. I I, I will say it's it's you can get, we got the light at the end of the tunnel. All these vaccines going out, I'm like, all right, we're on our way. I think by September of next year is what I'm on in my mind is when life will be back a little bit. So I think Christmas will be chill, but I'm pumped at the World Juniors, man. I'm excited, looking forward to it, Ray. It's always the best time of year. Watch these kids, and especially without like. I haven't heard anything about so many prospects because of what happened in March, right? You know, yeah, all the some right. the no Ivan Halinka and no tournaments where you're like this draft coming up. I couldn't tell you. Usually, I know a couple guys. It's it's pretty wide open. I know World Juniors is a little older, but looking forward to listening to you guys. 
Oh, thanks. It'll be, uh, it'll be fun. There's, uh, it will be different, of course, and same setup in Edmonton, no fans and yeah. all that stuff. But man, there's some of these kids with, they come out and they're just so good. So sick. They're it's just nuts. so good. So fun to watch. So we'll, uh, we'll try to keep it, uh, we'll try to get it, get it done and do a good job. It's just us in the rink, right? There's yeah, 80 of us people and, yeah. and the teams and that's about it. Are they going to pump some fake noise in the broadcast, like hockey and stuff? Yeah. 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 I, I don't It'll mind it. A, I don't well, mind Okay. Are you watching football? Are you watching football? Yes. Yeah. yeah so I, I kind of like the noise. Same, I, I don't I, want I just, it to be quiet. I couldn't agree more. I think they've done a great job with that. I actually watched um, Liverpool played Tottenham yesterday. Yes. And yeah. they let 2,000 people in and they didn't, they made it clear on the broadcast there is no fake noise. And it sounded like there was 25,000 in there. No kidding. Yeah, it was cool. That but, was good, um, though, wasn't it? Are you a oh, soccer guy? I'm getting into it. I'm really getting into it now. I'm trying to pick my it. team, but like the Premier League, Wednesday, Saturdays, I, I am loving this. And yeah, I think this is my new thing, soccer. Nice. What about F1? Are you into that? No, I haven't. But I, I haven't gotten into that, but a couple guys are saying that's now the thing. I don't know. I'm not a guy watching turns in cars. Okay. I've Okay, Wit, I don't know anything about cars. Do yourself a favor, watch uh, the Netflix documentary, Drive to Survive. All right. It is the greatest thing that I've watched of something really? I know nothing about. Every Sunday I'm up now watching these races. It's awesome. Wow. And you pick your team and you're cheering for a team and you're, you, I don't know. It's it's like the Premier League. It's like soccer. It's like you, you'll get into it. You'll, right. And it's Sunday morning. You got nothing else to do. No. Exactly. I'm uh I'm 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 giving that documentary a watch. That's for sure. All right, buddy. Thanks for your right, time, guys. man. Hey, anytime. Happy holidays. Hey, thank you for you guys. Have a great Christmas. Same to yeah, you. Merry man. Christmas to you and the family. Right. Thanks. See hey. you guys. Have a good one. Well, I'll play the role of Captain Obvious here, Ray, because I do it so well. But I mean, a big part of the success of Spit and Chicklets is the honesty, the transparency of guys like Ryan Whitney and Paul Bissonnette, right? I mean, th there are boundaries. Everybody has some boundaries personally or otherwise that you're just not going to go into areas, but they're fiery. They're funny. They take us all into places that you and I didn't grow up that way, you know, in, in television or in our broadcast careers having a willingness to speak as freely and be as openly right. opinionated on every topic possible as those guys. I mean, Wit is just, I mean, I, I, I think our, our YouTube viewers and certainly our podcast listeners got a real good sample right there. What Ryan Whitney is all about. Uh, I, I'm, I'm impressed because I know their, their shenanigans get a lot of, a lot of attention, yeah. but it's, it's not like these guys, aren't aren't smart about the game or aren't into the game or don't you know Witt played 10 years in the NHL yeah right like he it's not like they don't know and and Beast of course has got that reputation um for being a little bit wild we hear mm -hmm. how Witt just tells the story about how smart and creative he is and how he's able to draw up a commercial kind of at the drop of a hat and then when he you know, when we had him on, I, I think we saw a lot of that on our podcast when we talked to Beast as well. Yeah. So yeah. these guys, along with RA, they do an amazing job on their podcast. They really do. It's, it's entertaining as all heck. Um, but they're, you can't be entertaining if you're not smart. Yeah. You can't be. And, and they are. And Wit gave us, you know, 45 minutes of time and it was awesome. Yeah. And uh, they do. They do a great job. They yeah, really do. And, and a willingness to take risks too, right? And and look, yeah. we we approach that differently than than they do because we're not trying to be spitting checklets, and they're certainly not trying to yeah. to emulate what we do on on the Ray and Dregs podcast. But you know, we have conversations. We, we we joke about things that a couple of years ago we probably wouldn't have joked about publicly, right? We just wouldn't. Oh, uh, hundred percent. If you're going to be in. You're going to be in this um, in this stream. You have to be, and they are. You know, they do it as well as anybody in sports. Really, I just bought my first bottle of Pink Whitney. By the way, not the first bottle that's been in the Dregger house because I've got a 21 year old and a 19 year old, so they're very familiar with the product. But uh, see, I don't know the pro. I haven't had the product. And what's your uh, what's your uh, 
I haven't tried it. No, no, I haven't tried oh. it yet. I haven't tried it. It, it, it feels like a festive. It seems sort. more like a summer drink. Summer drink yeah. for me. Yeah, that's what it definitely. seems like. Yeah, but just for promotional purposes, I'm I, I'm definitely going to try, and uh, I'm going to. Oh, just my, for promotion? Yeah, yeah. If the bottle is like two thirds gone when I post it on Instagram, <laughs> <laughs> you'll know that I liked it. <laughs> um, before we wrap up episode two. News this week, um, and a direct statement from Henrik Lundqvist, too. Man, I always just enjoy spending time around Hank, whether it's in the NHL or we've had the, the opportunity at the World Championship internationally to, to be around him yeah. as well. Tough, tough news. You know, it was tough when he was bought out by the New York Rangers, but we can understand the business side. And I think all of us were fairly excited to see how things were going to work out for him with the Washington Capitals. He issues a statement. Right that sadly he's not going to be able to play in 2021. Um, and, you know, it seems like he's done, I guess. He's got a, a cardiac condition that has to be addressed, and there's too much risk for him to play. So a tough one, obviously, for Lundqvist, for his family, and, you know, from a hockey standpoint, for the Washington Capitals. Uh, it is for sure. It, one of the most respected players around the league for his career and the way that he conducted himself with the Rangers, like. When the Rangers were going to the Stanley Cup finals, like they were good, but Lundquist was he was pulling the pulling the train. Like he man, he was he was good. And man, did he compete. And so um he had this, of course, he he looks like he does. Uh he's always well put together, he's always really respectful. Dregs, I, I mentioned this story on Twitter because it's funny when you accidentally come across something i was doing a playoff game um it was an afternoon game and i i get out of my cab at msg and henrik walks out of the subway and gets we get to kind of like where you go into the garden at at the same time and you know let's say hi and he's got his headphones on he takes his headphones out and there's a a fans about there's probably 50 or 75 of them he takes his headphones out and he signs autographs the entire way stopping for a few pictures. Look, he wants to get into the building. He's a goalie. Goalies are usually in another world. But he had this self-aware or this awareness of all these people waiting. Nice. Um, he had this this easy way about him that he went through it with kind of a grace. And he made those people's days. And then he went and played his ass off in the game. Hmm. And it was really, I think, to me, it was kind of like a, a really great example of what nobody sees. He still was what people saw. No question. And uh, for me, much respect to his career and um, all the best uh, with his health here. And as they try to get a handle on what exactly is going on. Excellent. All right. Well, we're getting ready for the World Junior Championship. And uh, you've got a few more days to invest in self-isolation quarantine in your hotel in Edmonton. I know you've got a lot of stuff to get to, right? Like your, your, your schedule's jammed, isn't it? It's not quite jammed. No, there's, there's some gaps in the day. I got to say, I'm getting tired of the company already and I've only been here one day. (laughs) Hey, I know you're a workout fiend. Um, and, and with the knee, you have to continue that, right? I mean, it's all part of the, right the rehab, but you're also no stranger to the hotel room workout. So you're probably going to stay in tune with that. I assume throughout this drags, I'm making a, I'm making a, I made a commitment to myself because I haven't worked out much really. And I'm like, I ought to get back into the shape I want to be in. So for these three weeks, I'm on it. So I got a bike in my room. Uh, I got power bands to do my lifting and my rehab. And I hope it goes more than four days before I lose interest, but I'm going to give it a go. Well, as long as you don't get that wine shipment delivered in the next few days, you'll be okay. It, that, actually, it's probably better news if it doesn't get delivered. I got to be honest. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, it's always fun doing the Rain Dregs podcast. So enjoy your downtime. I'm sure we'll be in touch. You betcha we'll be at it next week. Thanks for listening, everybody, and um, be safe during the holidays. You bet. And we'll wrap with a thank you to our partners, as always, who make the podcast possible, Legaro.com. You can save 10% off all regular priced items site-wide using code RAY10. 
coolbet.co, the free-to-play sports and casino games website. Thanks for listening, everybody. Rating, sharing, and following the podcast on all of your podcast platforms. We look forward to seeing you and you seeing us on our YouTube channel as well. Episode three coming your way in a week. Thank you.